All right, so this is a Japan Digital Laboratory keyboard. It is actually USB, so it does work, and I have tested it, and you can use it like a normal keyboard. The keys are very um, tactile. I think this is probably one of the most tactile switches I've ever used. And I did use it for a little bit just to test it out. And yeah, it's pretty it's pretty clacky. It does use um, rubber domes, but it's like a dome and slider that's pretty pretty unique from at least the feel of it. It sounds nice, it feels nice, like it doesn't feel non-mechanical. You can feel the dome, but it's not like I don't know, it's enjoyable to type with at least in my opinion. Some people don't like domes, but but I'm going to take this apart, we're going to take a look inside, and I have some interesting plans for it, so yeah, let's go ahead and look at it and talk about that. Alright, so this is the keyboard, this is the back side of it, so this is the front. We've got some chips here, this is 74HC. CD74HC4051E Then we got SN74LS14 There might be some underneath this board here And then an uh, SN74LS145N So that might be some matrix logic or something like that there does appear to, uh, appear to be two chips underneath this board here. And then there's a board-to-board uh, -board connector right here, which goes to this little board here. And this has a microcontroller on it, and a pretty big one too. It's got a lot of I.O. It's got a, uh, what crystal is that? Uh, I can't quite... 16 megahertz if I had to guess, which is pretty standard for these. Uh, but here's what I was thinking. So we got some logic going on here. The traces are not too complicated. There's one, two, three, four, five chips controlling the whole board here. Then we got some auxiliary chips here, probably for the edge connector. If I had to guess, maybe something else, I'm not sure yet. We got the microcontroller here. So it's not awfully complicated. It may take some time to map this out so I know what's going on exactly, but Here's the thing, this microchip, I noticed over here on the PCB it says a few things. I don't know if you can see that, but it says dip switch at the top, it says one write, two debug, three reserve, yeah reserve something, and then reserve something. So I want to peel this sticker off and get a better look at that because if I'm understanding this right, since this is already USB. Um, this is like a USB connector over here. I'm thinking I can reprogram this chip directly and make it completely custom, which would be really interesting because then I wouldn't have to make an edge-to-edge -edge manually. I can just use what's here. And what's cool about that is potentially you would just have to attach like a little debug header here and maybe like... Um, a dip switch thing here, probably maybe just like a debug header, depending on what that does. Connect to the chip, flash it, and use the keyboard. So, yeah, I mean, let's take a look at and see uh, what's underneath this sticker. Okay, I don't really remember where I left off at, but I was doing a lot of reading around this chip here, and I ended up finding out that it. Uh, a lot of the documentation I was reading for like the programming of this thing doesn't seem to mention any way of dumping the hex file that's already on this chip via like a serial communication interface. I think that's what this connector 
missing connector over here would be it doesn't it doesn't really talk about in the documentation dumping the hex file from the chip so I don't really think it's possible to back up the hex file before I flash it with new firmware so the problem with that is is that I talked to so this uh, th this is a keyboard that I'm converting for someone. Uh, this isn't my keyboard. So I had to talk to my friend and I had to tell him, you know, like if I were to, you know, flash this with my own firmware or like program my own firmware, it would essentially break the, or not break, but the old firmware would be gone for good. And uh, not only do I have a, a problem with that, but I mean, I, I like preserving stuff, so I would want this to stay as is, if possible. Or if I can, like, back up the firmware, then you can, like, flash it with whatever firmware you want. And then if you want the original firmware, you can just put it back on. But since you can't back up the firmware for this chip, as at least from what I was reading, you probably can't do it. So I decided that um, it would probably... I like suggested to my friend like it's not really a good idea to like go ahead with flashing this chip but I did suggest something else and he said that it was it seemed actually like a better idea to do, to do this instead which is um, this connector on the back here so this connector here and this flat flex that goes to this other board over here the uh, connector on the back for of this thing goes right here which uh, connects to these uh, connections right there and probably goes throughout the board to scan the matrix. Goes back through here, goes to the chip. This just connects directly to these auxiliary buttons here, these tactile switches, which um, if we look here, that is these buttons right there. So I think um, what I'm gonna do is that I actually was able to find these connectors on DigiKey. So, first one is an exact, uh, just like, I think this is just like a newer part number, because I looked up the, uh, the num like the part, or like the numbers on the serial number or whatever, right there, but it was obsolete. But I did find uh, this one, which isn't obsolete, and I can just order it right away. And then I also found this part, which is not the exact same. I don't think it's from the same manufacturer, but the data sheet for this connector seemed to have the same specs as this one here. So what I'm thinking is that I can just print my own PCB, get one of these USB, I think this is a type, type B. Yeah, I think that's like a type B connector if I'm not mistaken. And then, uh, put like my own chip on here, connect my own connections here, and then I can just mount it on with the same, you know, um, screw hole mounting positions and everything. And I would have, I mean, like whenever he would want to use this board instead of the one I provide him, then he would just have to like connect this board in instead. And then I could also make boards for other people who just want to um, kind of drop in and not mess around with flashing this. Honestly, it does seem like a little bit better of a solution than messing around with flashing this chip and like connecting these headers and stuff like that. Whereas um, if I made my own PCB, it would have, you would be able to flash it over the USB and stuff like that and you could just like pop it in and it will work. So I'm thinking that's going to be a better solution. Uh, I was kind of excited to, because I did download that program. I don't know where it went. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have it up anymore, but um, I did download that program so that I could write programs for the chip on here. And I was kind of excited to write some software for a new chip that I haven't before, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking that just making a new PCB and slapping it on should be fine. So I'm gonna order these parts here and see if they work. And they should work. I don't have any doubts. Well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna probe all these connections and see where everything goes and map everything out. I think a lot of the connections over here as well are just for like this cl uh, clock oscillator thing and maybe like some other auxiliary like capacitors and stuff like that for the USB. 
Uh, the AT Mega 32U4 is very similar in this way where it has like a bunch of auxiliary components for stability and stuff like that. So I think that's what a lot of this is. These might be um, these might be for the header and like possibly this connector right here that's missing. Other than that, not much else. So yeah, I, I guess I'll get to that in a moment. I'm not going to be really super rushing on it. I'll probably get this done over the next few days, so I also got to map out uh, these connections over here to see where they go to the chips here. So far it seems like everything's secluded to the top row of the board here. So I don't really have to be probing beyond like some of the chips down here. I don't think it'll be too bad, it won't be as bad as the micro switch that I was probing earlier, but it will take me a minute, so I'll get to that. Alright, so I was going to start tracing out everything on this board, and I realized this is a four layer PCB. I had a hunch it was a four layer PCB, but I thought it was, um, or it could be like more layers to be honest, but um, I had a hunch because I noticed like some of the vias go through and you can't see, like if you shine this underneath the light, you can't see through some of the vias there. So I kind of assumed that it was more than just four, uh, two layers, but I thought it was just like two ground and two power planes on each side or something like that. But it seems like there is a separate power plane for this chip because this chip only takes 3.3 volts, whereas this is a five volt input. So there is a DC to DC step down converter right there to convert it to 3.3. So I realized that um, tracing out this even though there's not that many components on the board, like, I mean, there's a lot of components, but it's mostly just, like, resistors and stuff like that here. Even though there's not that many uh, components when it comes to, like, large components here on the board, uh, I was kind of like, you know, I don't really want to manually trace out everything, so what I did instead is that I saw, like, someone do this type of thing where you... I don't know if he did it the same way. I think I saw this on, um, what was that channel called? Mike's Electric Stuff, I think. I don't watch too many of his videos, but I did see this on his channel one time, like a long time ago. And I don't know how he did it, but I just took like a 16 gauge wire and folded it over a bunch of times and cut the end off and crimped it onto this ring connector thing. And uh, now I'm going to basically probe it using this. So I can swap this out too. Let's turn the light on. So I'm going to connect this to ground. That should be... I don't know. I don't know which one's ground. Alright, so I had to connect that to the ground real quick so this is now probing ground with the continuity test and if I just see what I mean you can probe a lot of different stuff doing this so I'll probably just brush it over like this gently I could, probably could even use a smaller gauge, but this will do just because there's not too many connections that I have to be like poking around with. So yeah, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that for a little bit. And I'll probably be using that for like some of the more specific connections over here. I already traced out one of them. I traced out the output of this 3.3 volt connector and it just goes to the voltage pins of the chip here. So. Yeah, uh, I'll get to that. Alright, so I was looking and, you know, mapping this board out and stuff, and I was just thinking, there's like these breakaway regions here. There's one right there, one right there, one right there, a few right here. And I was just thinking about, like, you know, what, what could have that gone to? And as I was just mapping it out, I kind of realized that this board here is what broke away from that as you can see from the top down view you can see that's what that was but 
you may notice that there's another breakaway region right here and I looked on this board over here which is like the keyboard itself and the PCB material that this keyboard uses is not the same PCB material these two boards use so they're not this these aren't broke uh, or breakaway parts from this main board they were a breakaway part from a separate larger piece probably and also uh, on the on the edge here you can see there's no breakaway part uh, pieces right here or parts right there but there are breakaway regions right here so I'm thinking there was like a separate module over here that's just not used for this keyboard that you know they probably broke it away and threw it out or whatever just because it wasn't being used but uh, I thought that was kind of interesting and I have a speculation to what that module probably was so my friend that I'm converting this keyboard for we were talking about it for a little bit and he mentioned that uh, he, he mentioned that these JDL keyboards sometimes have an LCD somewhere along here somewhere at the top I believe and this board obviously doesn't have it there's no like cutout in the plastic up top here for it but I was thinking that because there's like an unpopulated connector right here similar to over here how there's a ribbon for this guy here so that's how that connects in since there's an unpopulated uh, connector right there I'm thinking that this might have gone to an LCD on this side over here and the breakaway region over here was probably like a board for the LCD driver and now that I think about it it's probably incredibly likely that that's what that extra board was so obviously this is just speculation but I, I really think that the extra board over here was like an LCD part and it just wasn't included because this wasn't an LCD version or uh, revision or whatever but it's interesting that you know you can tell there was probably something to do with this pad there's no there's nothing on this board here that would suggest there would be an LCD but this uh, metal back plate probably could have been changed to accommodate one here maybe not sure but yeah no I, I definitely think this was part of it there so I thought I'd just mention that all right, so I'm getting ready to probe this now with my scope. And the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna plug the USB in here and I'm going to probe these connections here to see what's going on. Now, uh, the way this chip communicates with board to board connector here with whatever's on the board over here, there's like 10 different lines going from here the here through these two chips these are just inverters so it's inverting the signal as it as, as it's going out and then there's four different lines going in and they're uh, they're communicating to this chip via the MOSFETs here and here or actually uh, it's just these three here I think and then this one here not that one I forget what that one's for specifically but other than that, yeah, so it's just going through those to this chip. And I'm thinking that this is kind of like a row matrix type deal. So, or it'll select what row it wants. So it'll send a signal like one of these lines will go high through one of these two chips here. And then whatever key you're pressing on that row will come through the four outputs to this chip via the MOSFETs. If that's how it works, then I'm pretty much going to start doing the... PCB for uh, for I mean replacement PCB right away because really all I got to do is these measurements I got to slap on a, uh, a footprint for a Pro Micro or like a embedded solution and then just kind of like wire it up and that should be it like there sh it shouldn't be like very complicated to do that so I'm gonna figure out what's going on with this thing probe wise or well signal wise. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to get back to you. Alright, so I did analyze the signal coming out of this board here. 
And this is what it looks like. Let's actually start from the beginning here. So this is the the first pin on that board to board connector. Then we got uh, why do I have two of them? Never mind. Then there's the second pin. This is the third, fourth here, fifth pin, sixth pin, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. And the, the images that I'm skipping over here is the um, just the close-up of the beginning of the signal here. So this is just like the detailed close-up of that same signal. So I do have like a few screenshots here that I can work with. The thing is though is that I'm not really sure exactly what's going on here. I like kind of understand, but I don't really know what's going on with the beginning signal here. And if you look through some of them, yeah, there seems to be like a initial like brief period where it does things like really fast and then it slows down throughout the uh, processing. I'm not really sure what that is from. I could just, you know, say like, screw it, like I'll just wire it up the same way and like connect, connect the, some pins up the same way so that I can just like pull this the same exact way it's doing it here, but I kind of want to understand why it's doing this specific pattern. So what I'm going to do, I've already looked up the chip data sheets for all of these. They're, this is a multiplexer, this is a multiplexer, this is a multiplexer, and then there's two inverters. I have no idea what this is doing. So what I'm going to just double check is where are these connections going? And if they're doing something weird down here, then I'm gonna to try to figure out what's up with that. But other than that, I think this might be the output. So all I really need to do is check where the inputs for this connector here are going to the chips like here and stuff. And once I know where the uh, inputs are going, then I don't really have to like worry about the outputs because I know the outputs are always gonna be like some binary number or something. It doesn't really matter what that is. So, I was thinking the weird signals here, like the, the little weird, you know, quicker pattern at the beginning, and then like, the larger, like, more drawn out signal. I'm wondering if that's just because this chip here is confused that uh, since it's not connected up to this board, it's just not processing as fast for whatever reason. I'm not quite sure, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook this up and analyze the signal while this board is connected and I'll also like try pressing some keys and stuff to see what outputs I'm getting and when I'm done with that I will trace out some of these connections here to see which chips they're going to on this board and I don't really want to spend too much time tracing out all of the components here because it it's just like you know I don't want to spend too much time doing that I'm already taking longer than I wanted to as is on this so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and start, get started with that. All right, so get this. It's not exactly the same as the ITT, but it's really similar in like appearance. So if you remember, for, I mean, not everyone's gonna have seen the ITT video, but it had a very similar signal to this, where the more you press down a certain, a certain point in the data, you know, whatever key you're pressing, that's what key you get. This is a little bit different, whereas it's not saying a clock signal and I'm not gonna have to keep track of, well, I'll, I'll have to keep track of what signals I'm sending in the moment, but I don't really have to keep track of anything else but the uh, binary that I'm sending out on these pins down here because these are for the demultiplexers. It seems like it's only pulling one key at a time and these little uh, MOSFETs over here, those three don't do anything. There's nothing on the outputs of those. Even though the, uh, there is like a signal setting those on, I think, it's not doing anything other than saying, hey, I'm connected to this main board here. 
the real signal is only going through this chip here and depending on what signal is being transferred into this larger board if this signal is one or zero when that happens then a key is pressed so knowing that I am pretty much just going to start doing the PCB for this device because I don't really need to know much more than that I probably will I'll I'll reanalyze the signal the reason why I'm going to probably be re well I will be reanalyzing the signal is if I get so let's go to the first signal here here we go so as you can see I was right about it being confused when it was attached or not attached to the board here and if I move this over to here we also get a different signal on the second line that's not what we were seeing earlier I can I can like fine-tune that that looks like crap I don't know why it's flickering like that but I'll let it do its thing yeah these are these are not the signals I was getting earlier so let's go to uh, which one's three here this one this should be three a little similar might have to adjust the uh go still a little bit flickery but that's fine let's go to, to four let's just there we go that's four let's go to five yep this is five six Seven. Really? That might not be seven, actually. I forget which one it is. Oh, I think, um... Yeah. I mean, yeah, so different signals. I don't really have to go through all of them right now, but... I'll have to... Copy this pattern so I... I mean, I get the same output as this board here. That's looking pretty good so far. I'm going to get started on the PCB for that. And I'll probably just end off this video with me uh, plugging the PCB that I make and programming it. Alright, so the uh, board here is pretty much ready to go. If we look here, I'll twist the camera around that's what it looks like and it's very similar to the uh, actually it's exactly like the board because I took I took exact measurements so I measured like where the from all the screw hole positions and then I measured like this part in between here this part how deep that is uh, the length of the board obviously the length of this L piece kind of here tried getting an accurate measurement on this. It was a little bit difficult because it is curved and I'm not really sure like what the radius is. I could probably like do some math to figure it out but I'm a little bit lazy so I just measured from the bottom point here to here and then the sides here and I gave it a radius of these two sides and I just like uh, pushed like a elliptical curve down in there and I made it a little bit deeper just in case if I got it a bit too short and uh, I added a switch here that shouldn't hit anything I don't think it will I think stuff starts getting hit around here by the plastic case but anything past that should be good I can't really measure that very well so I'm not really sure but there's a uh, in the there's like a few cutouts in the plastic case to compensate for like the board because the board does actually like hit the case if they weren't there and this has a cutout right here so if um but then like the rest of the components like there's some large components 
in the middle here uh, on the other board that don't have cutouts, so I'm guessing that these components are fine. And they're th these are a little bit tall. Uh, they're 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 approximately going to be that tall, so I mean a little bit taller than what's on the other board, but I think it should be fine because there's a lot of empty space towards the middle if uh, it's not hitting any plastic. So. Also, um, they're pretty close to the USB port here, and it's not rendering in, but there's a pretty bulky USB port, so that should fit in well. The only other thing I need to do is test this circuit. I don't really know if this ATmega 32 u 4 socket or circuit will work. It should work, but just in case if it doesn't, I actually have another board that I copied this circuit from it's this one here, and if I can focus it, so there's our 18 mega circuit. And as you can see, it's pretty much the same exact circuit. The only thing I added to it was this tantalum capacitor. I'll test this circuit by soldering this board up. This is actually for the, this is a revision to the ITT converter that I made. I just need to test the USB connection and the 18 mega 32 u 4 connection and if that works then everything else should be fine so I'm not gonna probably not gonna do that tonight but I will do that in probably tomorrow all right so we got this thing here which lines up pretty much perfect I've already tested it so here it is plugged in and it does connect to the computer and I can flash it and stuff so that's pretty pretty nice and it is a perfect fit so if I put that in there you would be able to I mean I'm not going to do it right now but this ribbon cable connects to the uh, ribbon connector here and the uh, the board to board connector there is in the correct spot so, this is very close to done. If I, so it, it has been a little bit since I got this stuff, I was a little bit busy during the week. Um, but, now that I've confirmed everything's working, tomorrow I'll start programming it. And if I remember correctly, the, pr uh, the programming part uh, looks like it might be easy. So I already have an I2C driver that I've written, so the I2C part will be, uh, won't be a problem. But just getting it to communicate with this board-to-board -board connector, I'm thinking that I'll have to take another look at how this board is doing it. And once I get an idea of what exactly it's doing, because it seems to be sending some kind of pattern, all I gotta do is copy that pattern and send it over this I2C bus expander and I should have a working keyboard so that'll probably take me all day tomorrow I'm thinking like all day tomorrow but if I work on it all day tomorrow it'll be done by the end of the night so yeah this is looking pretty good and then I can go finally edit and release this video All right, <clears throat> so uh, I was testing this board and I did mess up a few things. I will go over that right now just so that it's clear. Let me turn on my oscilloscope here. So uh, the first thing that's wrong here is that a lot of the output lines that I have pads for here and here, and there's two right there, a lot of the output lines going to this connector are in the wrong order connected to this chip excuse me and uh, that makes it um, I mean I can fix that in software but it makes it kind of annoying because um, I have to write out a lot of additional code in software to get this to map out correctly and it does reduce the efficiency of my code a little bit so I did do a second revision of this PCB with the uh, connections in order this time and then I um I also I also forgot to include two resistors here to the I2C bus. So that needed to be added. 
But there's also another issue with the outputs here, and I'll show that now since I connected my uh, oscilloscope here. So let's get it on this one here, something like that. I don't need that this right now actually. And then uh, connect that up. <clears throat> okay, so basically, if we go to the I2C bus here, we'll see that I2C is working. And I did verify that it's sending all the correct commands, and the chip is acknowledging the commands. So I kind of realized something else was going on when the outputs weren't changing. And I was able to figure it out. So let's see if I can do this without shorting anything. All right. Kind of difficult one-handed, but all right. All right, so I connected this resistor from five volts to the end of that capacitor that I'm probing right there. And we're seeing this. Now I'm gonna stop that real quick in a sec here. All right, so let's talk about what this peak is here. So internally on this chip, there's a bunch of pull-up resistors that I've enabled on the outputs here. And when the output is set to one, it should enable that pull-up resistor and allow all these outputs to, uh, or it should set the, all the outputs to five volts if I enable them all, for example. Now, uh, before I attached this resistor, nothing was happening. When I attached this resistor, then it started outputting these peaks here. And what's going on here basically is I've got a bunch of one microfarad capacitors here and the resistance is so high on the pull-up resistors inside this chip that it's not got enough current to charge these one microfarad capacitors all the way up to five volts. Um, like at all. So if I, I if I probe this with just like this setup without this re resistor here attached, it wouldn't have enough current to output any voltages on these outputs and that's why I was getting zero on all the outputs a second ago there. When I attach this 1K resistor, it gives it just enough uh, current so that it can pull up to this point here. This is where it charges up to. But then once uh, the uh, once the outputs start going zero and draining all the current, it just goes to zero again, and so it doesn't charge all the way up. And that's why it's peaking out like this, like it should be an instant like square wave, but it's taking so long for the current to build up because of the capacitance, so it's only going up like a little bit, like a volt. Uh, so I did some math. Uh, this is the pull-up current. Now that's not the resistance on the resistors, but if you do uh, five divided by 200 microamps, yeah, you get a 2500, which should be the resistor or the resist resistance value on this. So it seems like there's 25K resistance or resistors in here, like 25K ohm. And that would make sense because we were getting nothing on the output here and it, that's nowhere near enough or nowhere low enough. Ah. Let me try that again. That's nowhere near as low as 1K to um, this chip which has 25K. So that makes sense why there, there was no movement because it wasn't even charging the capacitors at all. So I have a few options here. I can uh, either remove these capacitors and it'll start working or I can just use a lower value capacitor. I, I could just use a lower value capacitor. So anything below one microfarad is the nanofarad range. Um, I would probably say, I mean, I could do some math to get like a good value, but I, I'm thinking like 10 nanofarad or like one nanofarad, because I still do want some ca some capacitance on these lines, so it's a little bit more responsive. But um, yeah, these were way too low, so. Uh, I think for this test board, I will remove them 
because I think the only reason they're attached here is for stability. And that's, that's ideally why I would want to um, use them as well. But I think that's a second revision type thing. And if I just remove these here, then I can at least get this tested and working before moving on. So I think that's the best move here, just because I want to get this done and uh, finish my video on it because I haven't uploaded a video in a while so I just kind of want to I just kind of want to do this now so yeah let me let me go do that well 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 would you look at that okay so I've worked out some bugs I've been like bug bug debugging on the computer over here just rewriting some code I double checked all the outputs and the outputs look pretty close to what this board was outputting here it's not the exact same, but I think it's within bounds to like where it will give me an output. So I think it should be fine. The uh, capacitors, I removed all of those. I removed every single capacitor actually, just cause um, even on, on the feedback pin over here, uh, I think it was still working, but it was just like very curvy on like the, uh, the come up. And I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to remove it. It looks a lot better now without it. So I think I'm going to eventually put more on here. Well, I, I probably will just for stabilization. But it will probably be in like the 10 nanofarad range instead of 1 microfarad. Because I think I think my, 1 microfarad was definitely too much. I'll have to like play around with the values to be completely sure. The, um, I think... Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I got the outputs working. I mean, there's not much else to say. I'm going to uh, plug this in now and test and see if it works. The only thing I need to do right now is just see if the output sends a signal when I press a key from over here. And if it does send a signal, I need to add some additional code that converts that point in the signal to a key code. And then I'm done with... Um, the conversion. So uh, the only other thing I can mention is that the I2C bus will be going because it is a bit slower. I think I mean it's like it's like 50 times slower or something something ridiculous. So it's way slower than this chip over here and that's because uh, this chip isn't driving this line directly. It's sending what lines to drive to the I2C bus then it's driving the lines and it's doing that for two different banks. The amount of time that takes is just enough to make it like really, really slow. And I did even like, I did up the, the bus clock on the I2C bus as much as I could before it destabilized. And it doesn't really seem to speed it up much. So I th uh, what I decided to do is get rid of this I2C bus, get rid of this Pro Micro pad or um, this Pro Micro like dip socket footprint here. The reason I had this uh, dip footprint here was because I thought it would be kind of cool if you could just take an existing Pro Micro and slot it in and then flash my firmware to it and you would just be able to use it like that without the integrated. But honestly the integrated, like I, I don't really know why I was thinking that because the integrated is just better anyway. So I'm going to get rid of this I2C and the only reason I had the I2C bus was because I had the Pro Micro footprint. So once I get rid of the Pro Micro, fo uh, the Pro Micro footprint I can just use all the pins on the 18 Mega 30 TU4, and I can just get rid of this I2C bus. And on the uh, the schematic I did, instead of the I2C bus, I'll show you. So what I did here instead is I can't go into 3D mode, but uh, you you obviously have the Pro or the 18 Mega 30 TU4. The Pro Micro socket is now gone, so I added some uh, surface mount switches over here instead of over here where it is, like there's a switch here. I added them over here. Then I added an STM32 uh, footprint. That's just so that if I want to switch to that, I can. I don't really know if I'm switching to the STM, STM32 yet, but I do want to program one just so I can get better at USB programming because I need to figure it out for this chip and I want to figure it out for this chip. And then I want to figure, uh, figure it out for another chip that I'm not ready to uh, talk about yet because I don't really know too much about it, but uh, basically just added that because I want to get better with USB programming. So we got some more stuff for the STM32 over here. 
And since we're not using the I2C bus, all the connections from the Pro Micro over here are going directly to this uh, connector and this connector to it over here. So there's no more need for an I2C bus because I already have enough pins on both of these chips here. And that's pretty much it. I also added like a, a protection diode thing. I mean like I don't usually add those but you know I think I probably should start adding them because they're so cheap and it does does help a lot with uh, you know like high voltages going through the line and shunting it to ground so yeah I uh, I'm gonna plug this in now and test those lines alright so for whatever reason it's outputting this signal even though you know when I hold down a button you can see it dash across the screen there I don't know why I'm not pressing any buttons and it's sending a signal so this output I'm monitoring here is the feedback which I miswired which is directly connected to this chip feedback uh, goes or triggers high first before anything else and then uh, the A bank will trigger last B bank triggers before A bank which should be this bank so Eight output eight this is meant to be output one, that's what it looks like. Output nine is output two. Output three is actually feedback. And then um output four is out three. And it seems to be happening between these three or four outputs because it output three it happens within the threshold of three here so I think I need to trick it into it's, uh, I don't know I'm gonna mess around with the order this is uh, sending the signal in and I'm gonna see what happens because uh, I need I think I need to do something here alright so I just want to mention how I uh, how I fixed that problem there. So uh, here's like a Tmux pane or window, and uh, we got my I2C code right here. So this, this over here, uh, well, this is just the defines, but if I go back, no, 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 uh, that's not here. So this is where I usually keep my I2C code. I2C code, just in case if I need to reference it. This program is really simple, it's only 136 lines. And uh, it took me a really long time to write this, because I didn't really... Uh, for some reason it, I had a really hard time writing this, but I, I was able to get it done. All it does is, and uh, I think like one of the reasons I had an issue with it was the um, ATmega32U4 the way it does I2C is different from like a bunch of other AT Mega chips and I don't know, it's just like, it was just like a weird, a weird piece of code I had to write. And honestly most of this code does nothing. It's, I th like, really, it, all of it is just like uh, automatically handled, so like most of this code is just like handles for, or like C surface high level handles for the internal like registers and stuff, like there's a lot of register stuff going on here. I have like a buffer and that's about it. So that's what I'm referencing to do this I2C code over here. I have uh, this A bank register and a B bank register for the output pins. Now the way I was doing it is that I was writing to A bank and I was writing to B bank and then I would uh, enable all the pins at the same time, including that third pin that I have tied to directly to the chip. 
Now, what I thought was happening was that I thought this was enabling too early, and then the amount of time it takes to run these two uh, I2C functions, it took too long to do that. So it was just like causing it to bug out and send that fourth signal. But that's I, I rearranged the order and that didn't seem to be what was happening. So I, uh, here on this line, I disabled the, the oring here. So I, I have like an or command here for like bitwise operation. This is setting output one, which used to be output A on the board I have here, but it's supposed to be output one. I disabled this, and then I manually enable it right before I read the data pin, right here. And then as soon as I read the data pin, I disable it. And for whatever reason, that fixed it. So, uh, I mean, I obviously I'm gonna do this a lot more cleanly when I get to the second revision of this board, but that's basically what I did to get it working. So I'm gonna finish up uh, with this code here and we should be good to go. That was weird. Okay, so it's working. It's working, but uh, oh, well, you know, there's a catch. So my converter is in here right now and I can prove it. Uh, where did the, oh, here. So that's the original. This is my converter in here now. So yep, proof it works. So I noticed a couple things. On this guy here, I thought these were MOSFETs and I thought they were being driven by the large keyboard board in here going to this chip, but it's the other way around. This chip is driving these MOSFETs and they control the LEDs. So that makes sense actually because there's three of them going to the connector here. So there's three MOSFETs connected to the connector here plus the data. So that's four connections down to here that use MOSFETs. And three of them are these like discrete components. So these here, and then one of them is like an IC here for the data. So that, it, it's actually, uh, so I have to revise my PCB to make sure that it can enable these, because I, uh, actually, well, I, I might not have to revise it, but uh, it, might, it might be better to use a MOSFET, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look into that. So I will be revising that portion of my PCB. I will also be, uh, I already revised like the pin order and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, there's not really much else to say other than it's like I can type with it. I haven't mapped out the keys yet because there's like 128 of them, 126 I think. But yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna do that right now. I just wanted to make sure it was working and yeah, it does work. Um, not much else to say other than I'm relieved it's done. It was a hassle to get working. I mean, I'm gonna get these buttons working too. Gotta double check that those work. Not gonna have a typing test this video for for this keyboard just cause, I mean, it's not fully working yet. I'll, I'll probably get the key map done sometime this weekend. And uh, I don't know, I guess that's, uh, that's pretty much all I gotta do. I'm sure it would type fine. You can do N key ro rollover stuff. It's like disabling and enabling stuff right now. Yeah, sick. I have no idea what that just did, but um, yeah. I'm pretty sure this is done now, so JDL. JDL. Japan Digital Laboratory, that's how I convert my keyboards, there you go.